doing software, I guess, 44 years now about, uh, since I started college. And uh, for up till about 96, I was mostly dev and, uh, or, you know, lead or something of that nature. And in the last uh, 17 years, I still do, well, I really don't do any dev work now, but I still do technical training, but I've been mostly in uh, things like Scrum, Kanban, Kanban methods, uh, SAFE, that's a scaled agile framework, we do a lot of that. Uh, and again, I still stay technical. So I've written several books, uh, two technical, two process related, uh, you know, like you can see there. Uh, and what I want to do tonight is actually question some things about architecture. And so this is going to be, I've got some information and some slides, but I want to also be a little thought provoking if I can be. So let me ask you, does everybody know where you are right now? You all know where you are? Okay, so where are we? We're at Giddy Images. Well, you see, that's kind of funny because Giddy Images is a company, and it's hard to be in a physical location that's actually a company. Or did you mean we're in one of the offices of Getty Images? Okay, or are we on the fourth floor of a building in downtown Seattle? Or are we in the United States? Or are we in Seattle? We're at a meetup. We're at a meetup, yeah, forget the location, we're at a meetup. Yeah, it's funny because when you first said we're at Getty Images, that made sense, didn't it? Now think about it. If I was to say I'd give $100 to anybody who can come up with 50 ways, 50 different places to be, could you all win that bet? I'm, I'm not making the bet. I said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you could all, 50, that's a lot of places to be. So this is an interesting thing I'm going to surmise right now. Is why is that? Why is it we can say something as silly as we're at Getty Images, which at one level makes no sense at all, and at another level makes total sense, and nobody questions it? You know what I'm saying? Well, it's like a framing device. It's what? The, the perspective, the frame that we. It's the framing, exactly. Yeah. But do we actually even know what the frame is? I mean, or is it assumed? We, we assume, we don't think about it. Yeah, yeah, we assume we don't think about it. Is it any wonder we get into trouble when we build things? That's my whole point. We assume it. We don't think about it. And if we don't assume it and we do think about it, how do you know your frame is the same as my frame? So if you're writing software and you're not paying attention to the frame and somebody says we need to write something that handles whatever and then just put in any location any of those 51 things you could come up with, why would you expect you'd be able to do a decent job of it unless we start learning how to look at this now what's important to realize is it's not that we're bad at this. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's we're so good, so natural, we don't even notice we do it. We make sense out of things without even knowing we're making sense out of things. So if it was tough, if it was tough to, uh, to differentiate between a concept, which is like where we are, and then the specific case, get the images like an office, get the images like a company, the meetup, you know, on the city, something like that, if it was tough, we would notice we did it, but it's so natural we don't even notice we do it. Does that make sense? I'm going to suggest this is the root cause of all the problems we have with writing software. Can't off by one error. Excuse me? Can't <laughs> off by one error. And off by one error. Yeah, actually, I would, I would agree. <laughs> and off by one error. And the question is, how do we do this without belaboring the thing? Now, there's another issue I would suggest that as left brain Westerners, most of us. Uh, we really don't like to acknowledge this because we certainly like to know. It's definitely true for the males in the room. Right? And uh, that, that might have been sexist, but it was sexist toward women, not sexist away from women, so I think that's all right to say. No, the truth is we make a lot of assumptions, and we have to start being aware of what we do and how we work if we want to get around that. And architecture sounds like, oh man, this is a science, this is technical, this is the box, this is what you do. But I would suggest that who we are and how we are has a huge impact on it. Until we start noticing this, we're not going to get hugely better at it. And this is just the way we are in speaking and language. Does this make sense? Do you like what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk about is going to give you a lot more power on it. My intention is, is to raise some questions so maybe we can start questioning ourselves in a more natural way and question some of the assumptions. Because I think that's the only way you really get there. Uh, so I do have some tangible things, but I want to continue this a little bit. And I want to ask this question. So if you've got a system that, um, not brand new, but not super legacy, 
okay, you know, like say three, four, five years old, reasonably mature but not aging, and uh, you need to add some new functionality. So you got to write the code, then you got to integrate it in. Where is the difficulty? Is it in writing the code? Let's vote. Is it writing the code, or is it integrating it in? It's finding the right place to integrate it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's writing in the right place to integrate it. Yeah. Okay, but so it can be that. The architecture, you're going to put it in the wrong place, and you're going to cause more problems than you're going to solve. Okay, it can be. I agree with that. You can put it in the wrong place in the architecture and cause more problems. But problem so then, is it still writing it? So just between the two, then it still sounds like that's not writing it. That's putting, it's trying to integrate. It. I'm sorry. It's understanding the nature of the system and what the system is actually accomplishing, and the fact that the documentation that you wrote is likely out of date because what happened is the engineer was probably smarter than the person who wrote the documentation. And so what I hear you correct. saying is explaining why it's harder to integrate it in. <laughs> okay, so you're just giving me reasons as to why it might be hard to integrate it in. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, what I'm saying is that's where the problem lies. Yeah, okay. In my experience, that would be where the problem lies. Okay, so, okay so, so there are two cuts here. The first cut is where's the difficulty? Is it, it the actual functionality or is it getting it embedded into the system? So that's the first cut. Then the second cut could be, why is it difficult to get it into the system? But I want to do this again, because only about a third of the people voted. This is actually an important thing to look at. So I'm not looking at why it might be difficult to get in. I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. But is it actually writing the function, or is it getting to be integrated where it's working in the system? Whether it's difficult to get it in the right place, not cause one-off errors, you know, understand how it interacts with the rest of the system. Is it writing the new code, or is it integrating it in? We're still all getting about a fourth. So, you're gonna say, so do we, most of us think it's actually getting it in somehow. Or is it something else? It's mostly getting it in. And then there are different reasons for getting it. So, so actually, I'm going to take what you're saying there and say, well, maybe part of what architecture should be is, letting, is guiding you how to get it in. But let's look at how we do that. So I want to look at that a little bit. Now, what I would suggest that's kind of a little distressing, I've been asking this question for about 15 years. And the answer and the problem has not changed much in 15 years. The good news, it hasn't gotten worse. But the bad news, it was already about 95% bad. So it can't get too much worse. So the question is, why is this? So tonight, I'm going to cover three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the purpose of architecture, even what is architecture. I'm going to bring up some perspective models. I'm going to talk about three different perspectives, different ways of looking at the world. And then I'm just going to throw in some useful practices at the end. Because when you come to a technical seminar or something, you expect, hey, I, I wanted to learn something, not just question everything. So I'm actually going to give you some answers at the end just, or something to look at. So why have an architecture? In fact, what is architecture? I'm sorry? The blueprint. The what of a system? The blueprint. Oh, the blueprint of a system. So architecture can be the blueprint of a system. The structure of the abstraction. The structure of the abstractions of the system. What else? A set of constraints. A set of constraints. Yeah, those things I can't change in a sense. Or difficult to change. Why do we, yeah? I mean, I heard one definition I kind of like it. Is it's the things that a team needs to ask permission to do. Yeah, to, I mean, it's to, to one way of thinking about yeah. it. It's one mental model. Like yeah, that. it's like there's this, it's like, well, actually, you know, it's funny. You hear all those things, and they all actually sound, there's a, there's a pattern amongst them all. That it's kind of the structure we're working in. Um, so why do we want to have an architecture? I mean, why have this thing if it's constraining us? Because then you don't have any abstractions. You have to understand the entire system at once to make any successful change to it. Oh, you mean if you didn't have an architecture? If you didn't have an Yeah, OK. So it gives you a way to actually navigate the system and see where things are. Yeah, it's like kind of like the blueprint. That makes sense. So let's, let's look at this. I actually think that is a lot of what an architecture is about. Architecture is kind of to be an enablement. And there are different ways to look at it. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not saying this is the answer. In fact, I think it's an ongoing question to me what an architecture is. Because we've heard a lot of things about their system. I remember years ago when I, uh, when I uh, really started kind of studying, I guess, stuff more as I, was, as I was becoming more of a coach and trainer, I figured, well, I really ought to get a little more formally Trained. Actually, I guess I have I have a master's from MIT in computer science and electrical engineering, but to be honest, I never really thought that was good training for this world. It teaches you a lot of abstract, useful stuff. Uh, but to 
me, it's like, what is architecture? I remember there was hardware architecture, system architecture, all sorts of physical architecture. There was application architecture. There was uh, all sorts of architectures, and they all, everybody talked about them as being different. But I actually think they're kind of meta models that kind of like uh, r relate into each other. But you know, you can't talk about it as there's underlying technology structure like blueprints or layers. Like I remember reading a book I think by Jim Copley where he talked about you know you have pipeline architecture or layered architecture, you know onion architecture, all different kinds of things. But those are different kinds of structures. Those are examples of architecture. Those aren't really what architecture is. Okay, architecture in a sense is this kind of meta model. And yeah, like you said, like what you what you have to go get permission for. Somebody said that once at a talk, and I kind of like that. Well, that's a characteristic of the architecture. It isn't architecture itself. So if I'm a dev on a team and I got an enterprise architect coming up with things, if I want to change it, I got to go get permission. But that's not what architecture is. That's just something about architecture that's a characteristic. So it's funny we talk about like we know this stuff. At least I do, and I'm not sure I do. Because it's kind of, you know, when you actually get down to what it is, it, it's like all these different levels and how do they interrelate with each other. So I'm not really going to try to come up with a specific definition, but those are a couple things I thought of. What provides the context for change? And I'm intentionally using the word context instead of something else, like structure uh, or mechanism. Because maybe architecture doesn't have to be that structure. Maybe architecture doesn't need to be where I put things. Maybe architecture in the agile space, because this is an agile architecture car, of course. And actually, I think the architecture I'm going to talk about would work anywhere, including waterfall, better. But in agile, you definitely need it. So these are some thoughts I've had. So here's another question. Because we sometimes talk about architecture as scalability, security, performance, right? We've got to have good architecture for so we can improve performance or so we can scale. But when we have troubles, when we try to improve performance or scalability or security or something like that, what causes problems? I might start getting, I'm giving you loaded questions. I'm telling you, is it architecture or is it code quality? Could, yeah, code quality can make it messy, but architecture can make it messy too. They actually do it in different ways, don't they? Actually, I think code quality sometimes even worse. I remember one application I wrote in the 80s. I was trying to change something. I, I'd, done, I'd made one of these assumptions. Uh, I mean, it was absolutely so true. I mean, it just absolutely had to be true that direct memory addressing was going to be faster than any kind of indexed addressing. And this is like, don't even have to think about it. It's absolutely true. It's also wrong. Uh, and I, nev I never encapsulated the way I was doing memory addressing in this application. This was back. In, in the 80s, when you know when you had a lot like 640k, you know stuff like that, was, memory was real important. Actually, I can go back to mainframe times when we had 256k for 20 users. You know, re-entry code stuff like that. I'm a little bit ancient, I suppose, in that way. But I remember absolutely knowing when I built the system that this was the right way to do it. So I didn't encapsulate it. That, that's actually maybe being nice to myself because I'm not sure I would have wanted to do that anyway. Like back then, I, I was a very fast, brittle, I was a very fast coder of brittle code in those days. And anyway, when I decided I needed to change it, I couldn't. Now you can say, well, that was an architecture issue. And I'm saying, well, I don't know, it was a system-wide decision that affected how you address memory. It sounds like an architecture issue, but it was a code problem. It was a totally code problem. Now, had I attended it to like an architecture issue, something I might want to change, I would have done it differently. So maybe. Whether it's architecture or code quality, is what did you think architecture was at the moment? So and that's actually one of the biggest problems we have on our teams is knowing when it is architecture. Yeah, knowing when it is architecture. You know, and maybe if I had one of my other guys here, Mirkolsky, he would tell me, Alan, you're full of it. There's no difference. See, I, I just, and I'm starting to appreciate this. Like you've seen this, how many of you do? How many of you here do some form of agile, like Scrum or XP? Or have you started noticing how analysis, design, code, and test are kind of blending together? Yeah, I mean, test first is actually analysis with test specifications. It's not even test first. I'm sorry, you cannot test first. You can do analysis with tests, but you can't test it before you have it. I'm sorry, that was a misnomer back in the XP days. Okay, you can do analysis with tests, which you should be doing, and we call that test first. But the test, well, it's test like a noun, 
not tests like the verb. So we're seeing the same thing with architecture, I'm suggesting. And it's hard to tell which. But yet it is nice to have a distinction. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So I'm going to suggest this is another thing, you know, maybe a vision, maybe how to enable new implementations, you know, how to extend things. Maybe there's things we want to know how to do regardless of what we call it. I mean, say it that way. We want to decouple systems from the application. See, that might be the system architecture. I remember doing something, oh, you know, when was this? It was like 2001 or something, 2002. I can't remember exactly. It was a precursor to serverless. I worked with a company, they actually sort of, the guy sort of reinvented serverless before serverless kind of came out. And we're rebuilding this really cool system, and he'd actually done a decent job, and I was coming in behind him, just writing some code and stuff. And I noticed that he had actually had the HTTP request running throughout all the code. And I was like, this is real painful. So one of the things, throughout your application, you knew you were uh, using something over the web with HTTP requests, and it would have been nice that just when the thing came in, you converted it into some object you could pass around that had no idea it was an HTTP request. It would just have made things a lot simpler. Wouldn't have slowed you down. You can't convince me a conversion would slow you down because if it's coming over the web, you know it's slower than a conversion inside a computer. But he didn't think about separating those two things. So now we have all this baggage, and it was hard to get the right size objects you wanted in the place. So that's maybe an easy way to see that there's an application called what I'm building, and then there's the physical, not the physical, but the environment of it called Java and the web. So there are some things like that. It can provide standards. But let's ask these questions. What if we look at it this way? What if we look at things we know we'd like to solve? Like we know that we'd like integrating functionality not to be difficult, right? Which we just said was difficult. You know, and whether whatever the reason. See, I'm actually going to suggest what you're suggesting, what he suggested in the back about kind of figuring out where to go is one piece. I would suggest the confusion with what we're, where we are is another reason. Have you ever seen code when you want to integrate it? You've got to now I got this new case, but you got to make sure you're not the old case. And in this situation, I do this rule. In the old situation, I do that rule. There are like 47 different places that you've got to check for this. Because when it started, somebody knew where we were as Getty Images. And then what we discovered is, oh, they were talking about, yeah, this, this room and floor, but then maybe other rooms or floors. But we thought it was just this floor. So assumptions were made that we didn't get to because we don't think about it. So I'm going to look at what if we weren't tied to our system architecture? What if we were truly object-oriented? Like I'm not sure what object-oriented is is completely understood. We know, we think we know what it is because we're Java programmers, C# -sharp programmers, Python, whatever it is we do now. But objects are no. What's an object? Let me just ask that. What's an object? Instantiation of a class definition. Instantiation of a class <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask two questions. Is that correct? Is it useful? Let me ask three questions. Is it a harmful definition? I would suggest it's a harmful definition. How about how many C programmers are there in the room? I mean, you're used to programming C. And how many of you learned that objects were data with methods? Worst definition ever! <laughs> That's me. It sent me back five years. Then I read Grady Bush's book on object turn it sent me back another couple of years. Sorry, I like Grady, but I hate his old book. Because that's kind of where he was coming from. That here's a, here's a massive data and some behavior around it, and then we're going to specialize it. Objects, I'm going to talk about what objects are later. I'll let you wait until I get that point. What if we could be prepared for the unknown? How do we be prepared for the unknown? Now, I'm pretty cognitive impaired, so I'm not going to teach you how to read, read tea leaves and predict the future, because I'm pretty cognitive impaired. I don't want to do that. In fact, my motto is this. I'm not trying to anticipate change. We can't prevent it. In fact, I really feel a lot better since I can stop trying to do this. See, now we can say designing to accommodate change, and you'll see that asterisk there. What does that mean? When I say accommodate change, see, maybe, you know, we, we do things like later architectures. Actually, maybe change isn't the problem. Maybe it's the damage change causes that's the problem. And maybe we can make it so change doesn't do damage. So the focus shouldn't be on trying to stop change. Maybe the focus should be on stopping change from causing damage. Do you see how that's different? See, if we try to stop change, the way we stop change is 
is we try to anticipate everything that could happen. We look out into the future and we see what's there, so we don't have any change. Isn't that what waterfall is to some extent? Well, I don't know how to do that. I'll tell you right now, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how anybody does that, actually. I don't think anybody does do that. Because even if you did it on the first project, you don't do it on version two. Right? So even if you're lucky on the first waterfall project, you're now screwed on the second by definition. So how do we give this up? That's really what we're talking about in Agile. We're just going to give this up. So I do want to talk about this because this to me is, this is like a, whatever, we haven't even decided what architecture is, but I'm going to talk about the difference. So in classic architecture, we talk about a structure that contains everything, we anticipate everything, we understand the big picture, so we have a framework the whole thing, so we can find where things are. You know, I know that's not what you were saying, but, but it'd be nice. You know, learn what you need to up front and then go and do it. And I'm suggesting that we need to have a structure that can change. You have to modify have it so it can be really prepared for anything. <coughs> you know, understand the big picture so we can evolve to hold new things and set things up to use new ideas as they become apparent, because they will. So how do we do this? Okay. Questions, I'm just gonna, that's why you stop me, is you ask me questions. So. Yes? So if you're creating a structure that can be so flexible and flexible, that takes a long time, right? Ah, okay, so let's say he says if you build a structure that can be so flexible that it takes a lot of time in planning. And I'll actually, I also have gifts for people who, I, I don't throw well, so everybody, including you, be careful here. Okay, good. So maybe that assumes that you're building a structure that can accommodate everything. I just said I'm not trying to build a structure that can accommodate everything. Oh, but I did, didn't I? Set things up to new ideas. I set all new ideas. But does it really mean I have to do it without any change? You know, see, that's see. Actually, when you start tying this thing together, create a structure that can change. Prepare for anything. Does it? It doesn't mean I'm going to be prepared for anything without change. I'm going to prepare when something comes up. I can then change the structure at that point without damage. What does without damage mean? I'm going to suggest, meaning I don't have to spend more time in the future than I would spend now. See, this whole thing about, oh, if I get a new requirement, i got to change my design. It's like, so what? I mean, you just want to put all that. In other words, if I can defer the work to later, like maybe this is another way. A good, in fact, I have never said it this way, but I think I like this. A good architecture enables you to defer work for when you need to do it at no additional cost through the deferment. Would that be a variant on you? It would be a variant of, on your ain't going to need it. See, now I think he's just asking a question for one of those. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you something about you ain't going to need it. Um, you ain't going to need it should be an attitude because sometimes you know you're going to need it. The real thing is don't build it until you need it. Don't build it until you need it. So maybe the definition of a good architecture can somebody write this down because I've never said this and I'd like to remember I said it or something. Okay. I'm trying to the tweet it for you. The definition of a good architecture is one that enables you to write the code later when you need it at no additional cost by writing it later. But no savings necessarily. In other words, I'm writing the right thing later. The savings is I don't write all this extra stuff I don't need that makes it complicated. Actually, what I'm going to do is just know where I am in the time and then I'll look at my Somebody write down 26, 28. Okay. Oh, I, sorry. Sorry, wait a minute. Maybe you know the challenge you have here is when you said create a structure that can change. Of course, you are prepared for change. The cost happens when you need to change the design, but let's say you identify immediately a component that is going to change. Maybe by interacting with other components or having other, other different set of dependencies. Burn happens when um, these components that are impacted are being used by many other components that obliges you to start revising everything. Okay, so that's a good question. So first of all, this brings up an interesting thing. What happens when you have to change something that's being used by other things? Well, then you might want to look at is, are there ways to change components without changing the other things? There actually is. I don't know if I have time to talk about that tonight. There are ways to use facades. Maybe I'll just say real briefly. A technique we use, let's say I have a component here. And these guys are using it, and these guys are using it. Now these guys need something different. You could change this component, but build the facade 
So the old one still use this as it is, and only this one changes. And guess who needs to build those facades? Not these guys. They were happy. This is the guy who changes it. He needs to layer that facade in. So that would be maybe a way of architecture is knowing I've got that trick. But this is an important piece. And it's also that different if you're writing an architecture for yourself, or if you're writing an architecture for your, the rest of your company, or you're writing an architecture for users of your company software. Then what you ain't going to need kind of changes a little bit. By the way, there are design patterns that enable you to change. There are design patterns that actually allow you to add methods without changing signatures, which I know sounds contradictory. It's called a visitor pattern, by the way. There are a lot of interesting patterns that allow you to make changes to things when you add new things that don't affect old ones. That's really what patterns are about. Patterns are more important than the Agile space than ever before. Patterns are actually about <coughs> containing variation so things can change without affecting existing code. It's not about reusable code. It actually never was about reusable code. I used to know John Lacides passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. But it's design patterns, elements of reusable object or in its software. They said they never thought about patterns as reusable software, but Addison Wesley, the publisher, thought they'd sell more copies. So he told me. Anyway. Good book. I don't recommend it anymore. I think it's too hard to understand. Uh, our book is still, even though it's about 10 years old, is still pretty current in terms of thinking of patterns as the thought process. Yeah. You had a point there that set up architecture so that uh, as soon as new ideas are apparent, you have some way of uh, plugging in those new ideas into the architecture. If there are a lot of new ideas, like how, how many changes will you we'll keep doing in an architecture? There's no limit to how many changes you'll do in an architecture. That's not that's not, be careful here, this is a deep one. Okay, <laughs> you could, a, a, the definition to me of, I like, I like Ward Cunningham's definition of quality code. When somebody asked him how much quality should you put in code, he said take all the time you need to have quality code, but don't take a second writing something you don't need now. I would say the same things for architecture. If I look at where I am and, and two years from now I need a very complex architecture and there are a thousand changes between now and then, and I start with very simple and I add the thousand changes, but every change costs me less because I deferred it or costs me no more. It's not the number. Yeah. It's the wasted effort is what we've got to look for is what I'm suggesting. It's this change. So let's go into this. Let's look at some of these things and get a little less. I'm being a little theoretical at the start. But now we're going to say, well, how do we allow for all this stuff we're talking about? And that's cool. So next slide. I was just getting tired of talking about theory. I'm going to also suggest there's a parallel between Agile architecture and Agile discovery. That in the same way we know about in, in like Scrum and Agile and Kanban or whatever, we're discovering what we need. I'm going to suggest architecture is the same thing. We discover the architecture as we go. This is emergent design. It emerges because we don't know what it is. And even if you did, which you probably don't, this is something I learned from Ken Beck. I have a question with regard to that because it's the case that is happening we win the version one of an application, you now the customer wants you know, new functionality that obliges us to review the design and to make the, a new architecture to emerge from that. The customer is a little bit you know, biased with that. It's something that he said, but you guys foresaw already that this was to happen one way or the other. Why haven't you made the application in a way that enabled you know, the change rather than having to change the design? OK, so if I, what he's saying is, make sure I'm saying this right, when I rephrase it. So if you have to make a change to allow some new functionality, you might say, well, why didn't you make the change already to allow for this? And my answer would be, oh, because I thought you wanted that function sooner. So it's going to take me two days to make the change now. I could have put it in two days before, but then I would have delayed your application by two days. Didn't you want the application in value two days sooner? And by the way, that's the best case because I know more now than I did then. And had I done it before, it might have taken me two days, but now it's still going to take me two days. So this is the whole point. Architecture is driven by the reason we should be doing Agile anyway. By the way, Agile is not about iteration. Agile is not about the team. This is why you have so much trouble talking to business stakeholders, talking about Agile, because we talk about the team and Scrum and cross-functional and all this cool stuff, and they don't care. How quickly do you do business delivery? That's all they care about. And if you say with disdain, oh, I don't care about Agile, you're right, and they shouldn't. They should care about quick business delivery, and it's your job to make sure you can, can, you can sustain that. So how do we do this? How do we have this evolution? 
And I'm going to suggest these are some of the ways. Emergent design is a key piece. Testing at behavioral and functional levels. Some people call it behavioral, some people actually call it behavioral driven design, which is a nice name. We tend to call it acceptance test driven development. I'm not going to argue which is better. You test from basically from the customer's perspective. By the way, you can do ATD even if you're writing a component for another group. That's their, you're just, they're your customer. Okay, so that make a difference. Functional test is I know what I'm building, now I'm writing the test for the thing I think I'm building. I'm kind of talking to myself about what the test should be. Test first in both cases is useful. And again, it's not test first. Writing the test, doing analysis by thinking of what the requirement is in the form of a test is maybe a more better way to say it, better way to say it. It's because we're going to see that actually thinking of how I will validate something informs the design. Okay. Thinking of how I'm going to validate something informs the design of what I'm building to create a better design. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But here's something that y'all know. How many of y'all have heard refactoring by now? It's hard not to get to know this point. It's fine. Most people think this is refactoring. Well, this is refactoring. You know, it's about you know adding. It's about changing. You know, improving the design of code or the code itself without adding functionality. And, you know, you usually talk about it as there's a code smell. You know, you improve the design, not changing the function. You factor to improve code quality. It's a way to clean up code without fear of breaking the system. And uh, Martin Fowler didn't invent refactoring. It was actually a concept in the 70s and 80s. Um, but uh, he wrote a good book on it. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, you should have, definitely should read it. Um, and his whole book was about... Uh, refactoring bad code, okay? And one day, I needed to talk to him, so I kidnapped him, and I figured, out, actually I didn't really kidnap him, but what I did is I gave him a ride to the airport at a conference, and what was he gonna do but talk to me? I'd just slow down if he didn't, you know? <laughs> so I was asking Mark, I said, Mark, I love your book, uh, but it seems to me that you're only telling half the story, that, yeah, you could write bad code and then you can fix it, but, and in fact, a lot of people who are XP stock type programmers, they would actually, they just kind of hack code in. Now they know what it's supposed to look like. They refactor it right then in the moment and make it good. By the way, hacking and then immediately fixing like that is more of a coding stock. I have no problem with that. Putting it in and leaving it bad and thinking I'll refactor it later, that's bad. Because later it's hard to fix, hard to see what's going on. But anyway, I told Mark, I said, or asked Mark, I said, Mark, here's the thing though. What if I have really, really good code? I mean, it's pristine. It's as good as it could be. But now I get a new requirement and my design requirement changed because the requirement changed and I don't have the abstraction I wanted to have and now I need to refactor the design. What I notice is all the cool things you do in refactoring bad code seem to work for refactoring the design. You don't mention it. And he gave me the perfect answer. He said, yes, I agree, but my book was long enough as it is. And if you've ever written a book, you know exactly, you're ready, you're ready to just you know, get your life back. So I'm going to suggest there's another kind of refactoring, refactoring good code. Code's tight, but a new requirement makes the design now insufficient. And now you refactor the design. By the way, this is where refactoring to the open and closed comes in. If you've not heard that, you should read the paper by Bob Mark. It basically says when you have some new functionality, what you do is you don't add the new functionality in, and you don't change the design and add the new functionality. You first refactor the code to make it easy to accept the new code. You change your design, and then you put the code in. For example, if you had one way of, of doing a business rule, now you get another one, don't put an if in, rather put in a layer. And then use an abstract class and plug something in. So we're gonna see how this leads itself to a lot of stuff. So there's this refactoring of design, that's an important concept. Now this is something I noticed years ago. Uh, where I saw that I had tightly coupled code, I said to myself, I can't test this without instantiating half the system. Here we go, I'm gonna pull all this stuff in, I can't test it. Or, Man, this class does so much, the test will be enormous. You know, because it's weakly cohesive, meaning it's doing all sorts of things. Or it's redundant, I'll have to test this in lots of places. Now a smart person, you know, I would tell myself, I remember actually telling myself, I wish I thought of how I was gonna test this before I wrote the code. Now a smart person would say that once. It took me about six months of saying it almost every day. It finally hit me, you know, Al, maybe you ought to think about how you're going to test it before you write the code. See, I was always writing the code based on the function, and then I would start testing it. But then every time I did it, I realized it was hard to test because of these reasons. 
So I finally realized that if you actually consider how you're going to test your code, that is a kind of design. Does that make sense? I mean, you all seen this, right? This is actually why TDD, BDD, ATDD, whatever you want to call it. One of the reasons it works, ATDD and BDD work because they also bring out the assumptions, especially these, whether it's a concept or the particular implementation thing we're talking about. Testability is not how tested the code is, it's how testable the code is. Okay, the more testable, the better design. This is actually a high correlation. You've seen this in your own experience. That's why you should always consider tests before you write your code. Now, if you've already considered the tests before you wrote the code, you might as well write them because they're in your head. It's real easy to write them while it's in your head. And if you use something like FIT or FITNAS, you can, might as well automate them as well. See, the thing about automated testing is it actually doesn't take any more work. People think it does, but it really doesn't. Because you're eventually going to think about it. If you, it takes more work after the fact. But if you test first and then automate it, it takes about the same amount of work. There is a problem with maintaining the tests. I will admit that. But there's a way I don't have time to talk about it tonight, but I'll tell you where to look. Amir Kolsky and Scott Bain, two of my guys, are working on this thing they call sustainable test-driven development. In fact, if you go to sustainabletdd.com, they have a series of blogs, and it's unfortunately they've got so busy they haven't kept it up. But they're starting to talk about, they, they started it, and they every now and then write something new on it. It's the idea of how do you decouple tests? How do you de and that actually informs how to decouple requirements from each other. Okay. So we got the purpose of architecture is to allow this emergence, to allow you to add things. Well, what's, what do we mean by perspective models? Well, this is something also I got from our abstraction. There's a conceptual level, a specification level, and an implementation level. This comes from a UML state. <laughs> conceptual is kind of what you want. <coughs> Specification is how you use it. Implementation is how it actually works. So you can think of it conceptually, it's maybe our interface. Specification is the, or it's the abstraction. It's the, it's like if we're, if we're thinking of location as a concept, and the location could be the company you're at, the building you're at, the floor you're at, the city you're at, those are all different kinds of locations. So location is conceptual. Well, which, if, which one of those I just mentioned? Fourth floor of, what is it, 605 Ford or something? That's the implementation. That these perspectives are very important. Because suggestion is an entity, class method, whatever you want to call it, and a system should operate on only one of these. In other words, you should have an abstraction, or you should have an implementation, you shouldn't combine the two. Very simple thing if you notice that's what you're doing. See some puzzled looks. So I need to give a better example, or you get what I'm saying? It's like if you deal with location, if I got a system, the system should deal with the concept location by dealing with an interface, and then I can implement locations. And then, by the way, what can I do? I can substitute different locations. I'll show you some techniques for that in the in the next stage. How many people here use Java? How many people here use a language that's got a memory manager? Okay, good. Uh, how many people use C++? You can still do what I'm about to say in C++. You just might gripe over it. It's just as doable. Uh, the way you implement it is a little different. And if you want, I, I don't have time tonight because I've got to go home right after this, but if, if you don't believe in this, if you're C++, I understand the objection, but shoot me an email. Okay, I'd be happy to talk to a little more point you to something. But we suggest that you either create objects or you use objects, but you don't do both. And in C++, the way to do this means you're going to have to manage the creation of objects in a different way than just putting things on the stack that will go away for you. It means you have to do a lot more memory management. In Java, it's a freebie. The relationship between an entity, any entity A and any other entity B should be limited such that A makes B, A uses B, but never both. Now, why is this? In other words, you don't, you should not know what object type you're using. Well, you know what type it is, but you shouldn't know whether it's a concrete class or, or a abstract class. Now the reason for that is if I write a system that knows that location is concrete, and then I get another location, now I'm dealing with a lot of concrete classes. If it doesn't know what it is, and I get one, I get another one, a third one, I, I deal with it the same way. Notice there's no integration anymore. If integration is our biggest problem, then we can make that go away. Now maybe, again, thinking, of, I kind of like this theme about where it is. 
maybe some of these levels have to inform us where we make the change. Like, do we use factories? Where do, how do we manage this? So let's look at what I mean by this. Look at this, I have to look at the constructor. This was an idea inspired by Joshua Block, uh, writing effective job I read years and years ago. So look at this. So if I look at byte filter and I have a signal processor, so I've got this signal processor that's using a byte filter. It is the signal processor coupled to the byte filter. Plural, okay? Now, what, if we change it, and notice how I change it very little. I made byte filter private. I made uh, byte filter get instant static. I return a new byte filter. Now my byte filter is byte filter dot get it. By the way, this is not the singleton, obviously, because every time you call it, you'll get a new one. Okay, it just uses that syntax. Is byte filter and the signal processor coupled? Still coupled, no question. But. Notice how the byte filter, excuse me, how the signal processor doesn't know if it's getting an instance, and doesn't know if it's an implementation, or, or a, it doesn't know what type of implementation it is. By the way, is there a lot of overhead in this? Not from a programmer's point of view, and not really from a compiler's point of view. In fact, I suspect the compiler gets rid of this anyway. I don't know, Have anybody worked here on compilers? We did work one time with compilers. I'm amazed how smart those people are. They can just, I mean, I'll bet you this doesn't even cost any code before or after the fact. In, in .NET, this will get in line. This will get a what? This will get in line by the generator. Yeah, I mean, it just, just. It won't be at the compile time. Yeah. At your time at all. So what happens then? What if we, what if now we have different byte filters? We need different byte filters. I can have a factory figured out, and that's just a simple example. It could be anything. My name code doesn't change, the signal processor. Now when I need a new byte filter for my signal processor, whereas before integration was expensive, there is no integration. Okay, there's a little bit, I gotta change my factory. But that's not hard. Now my system is actually guiding me, where are the rules as to what instance do I use, and where are the rules as to how I use it? I'm separating those two. That's useful. Isn't that useful? Okay, I have a question, right? So, yeah. do you do the separation once you need it or an upfront, you know, like Okay, good question. Do you use it when you need it or do you do it upfront? Well, actually, the language like Java, I just do it as practice because there's virtually no cost to it. If I was in C++, I'd probably still do it as practice, even though there's a slight cost to it. In C++, I might accept the argument, wait until you need it. But I would definitely do it as soon as you've had two different ways of doing it. I wouldn't wait until you have 30 ways to do it, because then it's too hard to, it's out of the bag at that point. But really, what is the cost? Okay, I know some electrons might be dying in vain, but you know, really it's just energy, just moves around. So, just kidding. <laughs> but I mean, really, that's not a good reason. It's not a good reason the electrons might die. It's not gonna really, like you say, it's gonna get in line anyway. It's not gonna really make any difference. See, the thing is, it's really a mental construct. When I get something, do I know the thing's type? I shouldn't. I should know its behavior. I should know its abstract type. I shouldn't know its detail type. That makes sense? We know this, but we kind of worried about when should we put this in. Now the truth here is the bigger question to me isn't when do I do this, it's when do I use factory. See here I've got to get instance, so that thing can get pretty hairy. At some point I might want to pull that out and make it a factory. What we like to do is use get instance all the time, but don't use factories all the time. When we need a factory, now it's easy to relocate that get instance. Notice how, how cohesive that is and how it's in one place, and if I have to move it to a factory, it's not gonna be very difficult. So my suggestion would be always use get instance. Don't, and then when you need to move the get instance into a factory, you can do that. Because you might have actually different kinds of, uh, of uh, cases when you build things, yeah. So would you recommend this approach over, say, a dependency injection frameworks? Actually, this is what enables dependency injection. So like something like together, audit? Actually, it's funny. That's the, that's the perfect question. So hang on. I'm not, I got Don't hit the camera. I'm going to have to. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. All right. So, so let's hold that question, because I'm actually going to talk about this in dependency injection in just a couple more slides. Okay, there are structures in architecture. You know, you can have layers, you know, one layer not knowing about another. I'm not gonna actually go into this part of the architecture because I think we've all seen this and know this in layering and in layering or pipelines or whatever. But one layer 
administrator shouldn't know about another one. So like in the HTTP request thing, your application shouldn't know about the system architecture sim. So let's go through some useful practices. Simplifying it, number two is, is your question, Michael. Well, let's do this one first. So let me suggest what objects are. Objects are not data with methods. Okay, they are data with methods, but don't think of them that way. Because thinking of objects as data with methods has you think about the data and the method and therefore how they're implemented. When you think about how something's implemented, what do you know about that implementation method? You're gonna get another one? But now your client knows how it's implemented and will make assumptions about how it's implemented and now you've gotta change it. And that's one of the causes you have difficulty in integrating something new in. Is that fair to say? So we want to think of objects as manifestations of concepts or behavior, that or should be bolded. In other words, it can be a manifestation of like an abstraction. Like, I don't know, technically an abstract class isn't an object. But I could get a type of an abstract class, I don't care. It's just a concept there. Or it could be the implementation. So let's look at this. See, isn't that cool? What a quick question, yes. There's like a dependency injection and separating use from construction all on the same slide. How do these two relate to each other? So dependency injection is like when you put something into an object and then it uses that object to, you know, the object you gave it to uses that object. But how do you know what to put into the object? So the two actually kind of go together. Let's look at, a, at dependency injection. So let's just say we're writing a web-enabled sales order system and a customer signs in and fills out the order. By the way, what pattern mirrors dependency objection or is the simplest case of dependency objection? I'm just curious, somebody, just curious what somebody strategy. thinks. Sorry, what? Strategy. Yeah, strategy, you said that. I usually don't give these for answers, but I'm gonna give them because I got a lot of extras here. Thank you. By the way, is there any QA manager here? No QA manager? Anybody in QA? Former. Former, where'd you come from? I mean, physically. Uh, see, where'd you come from? That could have been a company. <laughs> could have been one country. I actually meant physically. How far away are you from here? You know, you come from Seattle? You come from Portland? Uh, Kent. Kent, that's where I'm from. So he's the only QA or former QA guy? What? <coughs> former QA. Where'd you come from? West Seattle. West Seattle. Which is further? We're actually in Miami. But I okay. Well, uh, he said it first. So I think he this is just my favorite Dilbert cup that I give only to QA people. Sorry, only one. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you a net objective as well. I love these. I, I just got this once. You know, I'm getting a little distracted here, but I've got one more of these giveaway. So, so I've been in Seattle for 18 years. I'm pretty much a Seattle one now. And we've all heard this insanity doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. But on this side, I don't care what it says on the other side, I want another cup of coffee. <laughs> Every day, we're really in search of the perfect cup of coffee. Anyway, so let's say we're writing a web-enabled sales order system. And the customer signs in, fills out the order, and it kind of looks like this. That means the task controller is using my sales order, it instantiates, it fills it out. And then we get the requirement, hey, we need to modify sales order because we might have taxation rules, different taxation rules. So now we need different taxation rules. And we could do something like this, that we could say, you know, if I'm in the U.S., I'll do it this way. If I'm in Canada, I'll do tax that way. I could start putting lots of ifs in there and stuff like that. Uh, but that kind of gets messy, and objects were meant to be reused, right? Actually, that's a lie. But if we believe that, then I could take sales order, I could derive it. This means, by the way, that, that triangle means the Canadian sales order derives from sales order. Those are notes off to the right. And it's saying that I'm going to overwrite my count tax. Okay? This isn't very good code. At a minimum, you should at least make different classes like this. I have a sales order, then I got a US and a Canadian. But this isn't very good either. You ever start doing it like this? Because they teach it to you, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, see, the problem is this works once. And the constructor gets his check, leaves, and you don't do it a second time, but he's already cashed the check, so it doesn't matter to him. But you ever get to new variations where things start expanding? This is because you're, you're specializing your behavior. 
which is not what objects are meant to be. This is actually thinking about objects as what they are, how they're implemented, and how I can extend them. It's why uh, Alan Hollock talks about talks about implements being evil. I wouldn't go that far, but he's right in the sense that this causes really bad problems. By the way, what the Gang of Four says, the gist, the gist, the essence, 90% of the Gang of Four is on this slide. Find what varies, which is tax, and instead of specializing, favor aggregation over inheritance. I'm using chips and, and encryption here, but instead of having a chip with different kinds of encryption, I'll pull encryption out, find what varies, encapsulate it, and then have the chip use encryption. Okay? Does this make sense? This is actually what patterns are. By the way, this is the strategy pattern. Uh, so notice we're encapsulating, we're encapsulating what's varying, which is encryption. Now if we go back to our other example where I had a, it's funny, I can't even say it without it sounding so obvious, but if I have a U.S. sales order with one kind of tax and I have a Canadian sales order with a different kind of tax, what's varying? Oh, amazing. So if the tax is varying and the gang of four tells me I'm supposed to pull that out and hide it between another abstraction, does that look something like this? So I've got a cal tax, which is my abstraction, different kinds. And notice if the task controller gives this to the sales order, then that's dependency injection, isn't it? Now if the task controller doesn't care which type of tax it uses, it can do itself. But actually it might be that you want to put the which tax I use as a get instance on USX. By the way, notice if I did that, the sales order could actually go to the tax object itself and say, get me, get an instance of the tax. It's still the strategy pattern. The strategy pattern does not require dependency injection. That's why I put these two together. You could use dependency injection. Somebody outside gives it to you. Or you could use separating use from construction. Ask the abstract class which one to use. The essence of the strategy is not that you're given it, even though that's what's shown in the book. The essence of the strategy is you have no idea which one you're using. Does that make sense? See, patterns are not solutions to recurring problems in a context. I tell you that. That's like learning how to cook. You learn recipes. Patterns are the thought process underneath it, which is the separating of these issues and forces. I'm just going to leave that as a tease, though. This is a strategy pattern. I have an natural tendency, you know, using the pattern. The problem in asset processing, in particular, when you have to complete your work, you know, like a two week sprint or something like that, sometimes putting all the plan B together, even if you initially have, you know, like the mental model, it's like it could take a substantial amount of time, and then it's hard to justify why you were doing all this, you know, just in you mean putting up the models? You're saying it's longer this way? Yes, I mean, you know, the original, the original approach was using inheritance, you know? And this is, of course, a reworked example that in some way favors maintainability. Yeah, but let's, let's, let's actually, but I'm not sure I understand if you're saying this takes longer. I mean, it, at, at least I, I can say, when you apply this as a regular basis all across, you know, the feature you're trying to implement, I'd say at least to me, you know, it, Okay, so, so he's suggesting this takes longer, and I know it does to most people, so I'm not, but let me tell you, actually, I think it can take less time. Now, let me tell you it can take less time. If I start out and I say, I've got a sales order, I've got CalTax, what does CalTax have to do with sales orders, by the way? Sales order, use them. It's not a part of the sales order in the sense of a type of sales order. So if I don't worry about the fact, see, this is one of the things that, so I love Ken Beck, I love Ron Jeffries, I love Ward Cunningham, I love XP, but the definition of simple, and somewhere they threw in the smallest number of classes and methods was absolutely wrong, because they know what it means and you don't. Me neither, for that matter. I'm not saying I'm smarter than you, I'm saying I, they have a certain meaning to that, and it's not what we pay to So if I started this out, and I know a sales order uses a count tax, and I'm not trying to use inheritance, I have cap, cap tax be part of sales order, but I will have a sales order object, and I will have a cal tax object, and I will have a cal tax object. But now notice what happens if I'm using separating use from construction. I don't say I have a US cal tax, I say get instance cal tax, even when I had only one. It goes back to what you said, when do I start? Right away I start with one. 
So imagine if I started with one count tax, get instance of count tax, and now I need the second one. Okay. Now I extend my design with the second one. I have taken less time up front because I'm not worried about it. But by doing get tax, I now go from where I go from one to two like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why you start right from the beginning, and it avoids all this having to figure it all out. But it's a discipline. And it's a discipline. See, discipline. See, discipline is what you do when you don't think you need to do it. It's just I just made that up, and it seems right. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Like, like you're supposed to look both ways before you cross the street. And maybe discipline is the way you always look both ways before you cross the street. But if you hear a car coming, you're going to look. That's not discipline. That's just, I hear the car coming, I look. You see what I mean? So in a sense, you do this little bit of getting some, that's a discipline, it's a practice, because there's almost no cost, but you always do it. Why? Because you might need it and you don't know, but it sets you up for later. So this is a nice thing, that, that, that dependency injection, you can pass it in or you can use separating use from construction. They're not the same thing, but they're the same intention of not knowing which one I'm using. And get instance as a way of doing that. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get practices down that don't cost me anything. <coughs> you know, there's this huge debate in Agile that there's no such thing as a best practice. I wish I could do some profanity here, but that's just wrong. It's wrong. There are best practices. Now some complex best practices aren't best everywhere. Yeah, and there's always an exception to something. But not binding something to something else is pretty much a best practice. Yes. So, <coughs> so I, I actually. Uh, Added up like an ERP system, the whole thing, and and the, th the thing is like with the U.S. and the Canadian taxes and, and, and those others, most business people expect you're going to sell your product in the U.S. and you never imagine you're going to sell it in Canada or in France or right. Italy and so forth. So you never you never have your team build in that way. That's right. Except so so good point. That wasn't quite a question, but it was. Uh, let's see if I get this deal. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was good. Okay, they're soft. They don't really work. So, so, have you ever had a customer say, this is the way we're going to do it? Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's wrong. So, you say, are you really for sure? And they say, yes. Oh, okay, well, since you're sure. Yeah. Do you believe it? No. So, this is the thing. This is my whole point of where we were this morning. I mean, not this morning, but an hour ago. Where, where are we? So the truth is, I don't care what they tell me. I don't care if they're absolutely certain. I don't want to add any extra code. But can I do it with virtually adding no extra code? Okay, virtually no extra code. See, I'll tell you something I did once. Is it okay if I run 10 minutes over? Can I can tell a little more stories if I run 10 minutes over. I'm going to run 10 minutes over. So I taught a, jo a Java class once. I swear I did this. This was I, this is part of the mischief was part of me once. I couldn't help it. I could have helped it, but I did um, so I was really starting to think that you should always write things like this. And I happened to be teaching in Java class. <laughs> and I remember thinking, you know, people who know Java and just want to take the class and get better, they will object to this. But somebody who doesn't know anything about Java, they wouldn't know to object. So at the start of the class, I told people, how many of you don't know the first thing about Java, have no idea, have never seen it? And I got, what, four or five people. And then how many of you have seen it and you're just really here to learn it better? And I had about the rest of the house, about another five or six people. So the four or five who had never seen Java, I told them that is how you instantiate an object. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they were no slower than the other people. Somewhere in the class I told them I was lying to them. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It just, you type that out so fast. Can you imagine that you just get used to this? It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost you, it doesn't even cost you time. I mean, if, look, if this is taking you longer to type, take a typing class, seriously. <laughs> so I'm suggesting what we want to do is look at some practices that get us some stuff. And the things I'm showing you are just those that can actually get you evolving architecture. And when somebody tells me this is it and I'm not dreaming, see, when I ask where we are, we don't question what that means. When somebody says this is where it is, what you know is, I don't know if it will change, but I know it might change. So when it does change, how many different places do I want to be able to have to go and fix? So when something changes, how many places do you need to be able to fix? But isn't that One. true? Isn't that true when you start? You know, you're using a double there. You could have, you know, 
if you start accepting bitcoins, the bitcoins crash, you may have more than a double. Well, up. actually, one of my guys wrote a book on this called Refactoring. He said you shouldn't be using doubles for stuff like that. How much cost is that? Type def in C, C or C sharp, C++. There are all sorts of things you can do in Java. And <coughs> what's, why don't we do that stuff? Yeah, you can take this all the way down if you want. What's the cost? The cost is we don't think this way. And it feels weird. It does. I know it feels weird. But if you actually look at what's the cost, there isn't any, except it forces us to think in a way that separates the instantiation from the concept, which I think is a good idea. No, think about this. I mean, really start looking at this. Start looking at what it costs you so you don't have to think abstractly. And are there ways that you can start thinking abstractly? Now, of course, you probably need decent testing to make this work because it's a little abstract. It is a little abstract at times. So a test harness, things like that. But you should be doing tests first anyway, which I'm not going into here. OK, so dependency inversion. I want to talk about this. Let's so, add something before you go on. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, to go back to, can you go one back? Yeah. Uh, about this, uh, and you just mentioned testing, and I, I struggled with, you know, it takes longer. And I, I do I do test around development every day, basically. And yeah. something that would really bite you in the rear with this particular code, as far as taking the, the sort of the misconception that it's going to take less time if you did it, you know, the if way, if Canadian, if a different US right. and all that, is that as soon as you, you start testing that, um, <laughs> you're already in, in pretty deep water because now you're instantiating the whole thing versus if you try to test this, the, the advantages is taking less time because you will basically have two, two test cases for US yep. and Canadian as individual, as, as a much smaller system so there. I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying this actually takes less time from a testing point of view because I have tax in one thing and I have the sales order in another thing. Exactly. Whereas if I had it embedded, so you just want the extra cut. Exactly. Is that such a nice comment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I think an additional uh, yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, actually, but you see, if I start arguing that, people won't believe me. But I, when you argue it in the audience, it's like, oh, maybe there's another crazy guy out here. Maybe there's some truth to it. I think the other point the, to follow on to that, though, is that it's really important that you get these abstractions correct if you want to help your testing burden later. I would because suggest, if you get them wrong, I would it suggest messes no. it up. I would suggest it's important you get them in one place. Well, I, I think what I mean by right is that you pulled out calc tax and not something that looked a little bit like it but really wasn't. Well, right? I would so suggest. You didn't pull out the right concept. So I would suggest two things. I would suggest that. Anything that varies that you pull out, if you shouldn't have pulled it out, you can put it back. But if it varies and you don't pull it out, then you're going to get into trouble. So I'm not worried about pulling out too much stuff. I, I might add some extra complexity and problems. But I'd rather isolate things. Isolating variation, I would say, is never going to hurt you too much. Yeah? I'd like to make a comment on that as well. And that is, is that the test department and QA department should feel enfranchised enough to where if they disagree with what the screw-headed thing that you designed was wrong, and they have uh, a different opinion, that they should be able to talk to the engineers yeah. and say, look, did you miss this little point here? Can you change the architecture to improve the tests? And hopefully if there's that, that duality of communication between either the QA department and the, the architects or the developers, that both parties will communicate. Now, one of them may be wrong, but the fact that the other side of that equation is actually thinking about the problem, that's good for the quality of the system. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the thing is developers really need to understand how tests inform design. And what I hear you saying, then, if that's the case, and the people who are running the tests can see that the tests are difficult or they should be testing something else, then they should be able to say this to the devs because the role of test is not to validate the code, by the way. The role of test is to validate the process through which you're writing the code. Here, I'm just going to see if this will pop up. This is what's on the mug I gave uh, the former QA manager. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Isn't that a true? I, I've heard that as a true story. Is I know just, people. I, I, I had lunch yeah. with somebody who was at a company that literally did this. Uh, okay, good. His Never regret mind. was yeah. he didn't get in on it. I love the Dilbert, but I mean, it's true. Like, it's, it's funny because I've heard that from people. I know people have done that, so it's unfortunately true. The point of testing, the role of QA is to make it so bugs don't happen, not to find them later. Anyway, let's come back to here because I'm. I want to just make the 10 minutes after. So anyway, the, uh, the dependency inversion principle, basically what this says is high-level modules don't depend on the low-level modules, because if you change the low-level module, you don't want to ripple up and get the high-level module. So your abstraction shouldn't depend on the details of how you implement it. Basically, it's saying that you define the interfaces of, your, of, of what you're using, what you're dependent on. The interface of what you're dependent upon gets defined by what's using it. This is why we call it dependency inversion principle. A might use B, so A depends on B, but B's interface is defined by A. Why? Because then if I get different implementations of B, I still define it by A and it works the same and A doesn't care that B changed. This is dependency inversion principle. There's a reference here. These slides are going to be available uh, but you're, you're going to make the recording available, Michael, right? You know, I, I can give you the PDFs of the slides, too. Okay. And they'll be on our site. So again, what you're doing is, and this actually relates to what I was talking when things change and other people use it, then if I have the clients, I might have a new implementation, but it's got to fit that interface. If I do need to change the interface, and I didn't think of putting the visitor pattern in, then maybe I'll make a new one, but facade it to work on the old one. There are ways to do this. This is really what patterns are about. Okay, design for the unknown. This is Scott Bain's magic card. Oh, I forgot to bring some. I can't believe I forgot to bring some. Sorry. I actually have these magic cards, but I just didn't bring them. <coughs> but I, I have it in the PL point. So here's a, this was a real problem I had a few years ago. I was told about this real-time processing system. We had machinery. Stuff was coming in on machines and going from one machine to the next machine. They were doing some, like sawing lumber or something or making trusses all automated. <laughs> and the problem when you have machines move stuff around in a factory, if some machine is slower than another machine because of the messaging, if accidents happen, people get hurt, stuff like that's really bad. Any real-time thing can always have a performance issue. Even if you think you can't have a performance issue, it always can. And I was there and they were saying, Al, how do we deal with this? You know, you've got design pattern guy, tell us what to do, you know all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm not pre cognitive impaired. How do I know what though? message handling problem was going to be. In other words, they, all these machines had to talk to each other. They knew that. They knew there was going to be performance. They were looking at me to tell them what the performance problem was going to be. And I'm saying, oh, I have no clue. What I do know, what I do know is I got different approaches. I can figure out how the performance problem will show up. But I don't, maybe I can, maybe I can't. I'm precognitive impaired, so I'd suggest I can. Or I can just do what's best and fix it later. But how do I know that's not going to cause a lot of rework? I could use Scott Bates' Magic Consulting card, which I'll show, but I actually, if I don't have his card around, I have this attitude. I'd say this is equivalent. How would I design, and, and unfortunately this is how I think, because I usually am wrong. How would I design if I knew no matter what I did would be wrong? Because it usually is. I didn't put that down there, but that's why I have this attitude. I'm not being magnanimous here. I'm being serious. I've been programming. Well, I haven't programmed an awful lot the last four years, but so for 40 years, I programmed, or usually the way I did it the first time wasn't the right way to do it. The way I designed it the first time wasn't the right way to design it. It took me 32 years to figure that out. I'm slow sometimes, sorry, but I am. It took me 32 years to figure this out. At that point, I realized I better design it, assuming that however I do design it is not how I should have designed it. How would I design it then? Okay, seriously. So if you're going to design it, what do you do? Well. It seems like I'd like to design it so I can change it later, right? Well, actually, we have this card. Scott, I'm not going to read all this, but Scott's uh, one of our, he has another way. He just has a magic card. He doesn't have to think. He just does the magic card. I, if I had one, basically, it's like this. You, you, he has a whole mantra about it. You, you say, well, you know, how should I design? the interface, how should I design the message channeling system? How should I design the message channeling system? How should I design the message channeling system? You flip the card over and it gives you the answer. <laughs> we have a deck of these. They're all saying in caps like that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell people, pick a card, any card, and mix a card, and as they pick the other cards, they'll say caps like that. 
Now, what's funny is I did the first time I used those cards, I was doing it in a design patterns class, and I had one project manager in the class, which I asked him, why are you here? This is a tech course, right? What's a PM doing here? And uh, I mean, not belligerently, I just asked him, I was curious. And he said, well, half these guys are my guys, I want to know what they're learning. I thought that was good. <laughs> I mean, I did think that was good. You know, he's learning this approach. So I say this magic card thing, and the, everybody laughed like you did, but he said, I want one of those. And I said, wait a minute, they're the developers, they're the ones who need it. Why do you want one? And he said, well, they're always telling me they don't know what to do, and I just can give them a card. <laughs> <laughs> really smart guy. So that's right, so I encapsulate the message handling system, don't I? If I encapsulate the message handling system, then when I find out how I should have designed it, it's encapsulated, I can now put it in correctly. By the way, if I am encapsulating the message handling system, because I'm gonna have to change it, how much effort should I put in the message handling system? Yeah, minimum? Yeah, maybe even mock it. You know, so this is a good way to go with things as well, okay? So the good news is the card's always right. The bad news is it doesn't always tell you what to do. But there are a lot of patterns that will tell you what to do. This sounds a little bit like a mediator or something to me. I'm not going to go through these, but it's just another reference. We have a place that actually tells you, see, we, we believe that patterns in the Gang of Four are all about hiding the thing on the left. Because patterns are about finding what varies and encapsulated. It's not always behavior. It could be cardinality, order, things, things like that. So we've arranged it, so it's just a good, it's, it, it, if you can't remember the URL, go to netobjectives.com, resources, technical, and then there's a link, or just get the PDF, or shoot me an email and I'll send you this. Okay, last one, I'm almost done. Avoid redundancy, so what does Kent Beck say? I like Kent, but he said something that's impossible, once and only once, you can't do anything once and only once, I'm sorry. If I've got an object here, and it's got an interface, and I've got an object here, and it's calling that interface, what's redundant about this? The interface, this guy knows what that interface is. If I change this, I change that. The test for redundancy is if you change one thing, you gotta change something else. It's impossible to avoid redundancy. But can I manage it? Okay, and the answer is yes. So, long time ago, 10 years ago. Oh, I do have one more goodie to give out. Somebody came up to me in a design patterns class. He said, Al, you've written a successful book. This is my design patterns explained. I am proud of it. I still think it's a very relevant book, and it's the only book that's talked about the theory, not the theory, the, the thought process of patterns. It's like patterns are often thought of as recipes. We think of patterns as the essence of great cooking. That's beyond recipes. They give you the insights into the great cooking. That's how we wrote the book. It's still relevant. Somebody anyway came up to me and said, Al, you've written a good book. You ought to name something after yourself. I love this guy right away. You know? <laughs> I need more people like this. So I go home, and I'm serious about this. I go home and I think about it. So I said, okay, what can I name after myself? And this was the only thing I could come up with. If n things, I'm a mathematician by trade. So if n things need to change, and n is greater than one, say I've got to have a formula, and anything I'm going to call shallow is log. I'll find it most n minus one of these things. Now it's not complimentary, I admit, but it was the only thing I could come up with that was true. I could say it was about me. But I think some of you have this characteristic as well. So I thought about it. Actually, I didn't really think about it. That'd be nice to, to say myself. A couple months went by, and I kept saying this, and people would laugh, and somebody kept saying, you ought to do something about this. And I said, oh, you're right. So let's look at Shallowy's principle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Now, yeah, it sounds funny, but what do I mean by that? Now, I admit, my history is strong type languages. I mean, I know lots of languages, but, you know, I don't like, I don't know, you know, like uh, Python, which is a weekly type language. I don't know small talk. I know, I know C Sharp, C++, Java, 20 other languages that are weird, but, uh, but in Java and C Sharp and C++, if I, um, if I design the interfaces, and I use abstractions, and I make sure there's only, uh, if, if I change something, and I, like if I have an abstract class and I have, an, I'll say, an uh, abstract method, and I need, to, I need to implement a virtual method, I need to implement it, and I don't, the, the linker will find it. Or if I change it over here, and I don't change it over there, the compiler finds it. But see, those aren't errors, those are to-do lists. Right, if, I have a, if I've got this here, and it's used by 20 places, and I change it, I don't have to find those things. See, if I use globals or things like that, the compiler, the linker, aren't going to help me. 
If I use ifs, the compiler, the link isn't going to help you. But if I use layering and abstraction and I change something, the compiler and the linker will give me a to do list. See what I'm saying? So the, the way really what this really means is when you're designing, even if it's in something like Python that doesn't have, that is not strongly typed, so it's not going to give you that kind of checking. What you want to ask yourself, and this is why it relates to uh, the thing you said at the beginning of where do I look. I would suggest you look at, well, if I'm going to write it this way, how many places am I going to have to look? If it's more than one, no, you've, you've put a time bomb in your system. You've got job security. Do you see what I mean? No, thanks. So, yeah, I agree. But, but, but that's, that's part of the issue. So the rule here might be better stated, you know, shallow is corollary. Well, this corollary too, because I'll tell you what corollary one is. Uh, is when you design, look to see how many places you have to change and how you find them. And if you're basing it on memory, forget that one. By the way, there is a corollary to Shalloway's law. This actually happened. I was working on a system where I always had, I just always called it a method on an object. Oh, this thing does this, this thing does this, this thing does this. And then I got this change where, you know, sometimes I didn't have an object. You know what I mean? I was always calling an object to do something, and then there was this case, oh, so now I started doing if, you know, my object's not equal to null. And I, I literally wrote if, so I had the if my object not equal to null. You know, then my object do something. If my object not equal to my object. And I'm doing this about, about three or four in these. And then I say to myself, you know, Al, you're not going to find them all. Remember, shall always law. Oh, crap. So then I undid control Z, control Z, control Z, get out of there. I put in the null object pattern. The logic pattern returns an object that doesn't do anything. So the, my object always existed. I just told you another pattern here. So if you find you're doing something where you're looking for something, if you're making a change that is inherently causing you to do something multiple times, know you're setting yourself up for a failure. Does that make sense too? So you want to start looking at your behavior and architecture results from that. So this is my last slide. Still got a thing. This is a t-shirt, we ran out of them, but I've got to get some more. So, and then I'll close with this. So you remember Rodan's Thinker? You know the guys going like this? So we have this t-shirt where it shows Rodan Thinker, and it says you still got to think. And then on the back it shows a bubble balloon. You know, a thought balloon, what he's thinking about. He's thinking, damn it. Damn it, that you still got to think. <laughs> so if you came here thinking I was going to give you an architecture that you didn't have to think, this is just how you build it, I'm sorry. You still got to think, but hopefully I've given you some stuff to think about. So thanks for being here. Um, just one thing about webinars. By the way, if you found this interesting, I'll, I'll put in a 15-second blurb about that objective. So we, of course, do technical training, ATU, ATUD, emergent design, design patterns. If you're interested, let me know. That's my email address. Happy to chat. Uh, otherwise, I appreciate you being here and staying a little late. Oh, 8.09, a minute early from being 10 minutes late. You got so your 10 minutes. <laughs>